So, hi, and welcome to Venture Bros, a Venture Brothers podcast hosted by After the Hype. I am Brian Dressel. With me, as always, is Nick Olis Friedemann. That is my name, yes. Uh, am I pronouncing your last name, Rick? I'm not sure if I've ever actually asked you that. It's Fried if, the Man, right? Yes. Okay, uh, cool. My my ancestors were very into giving people great discounts on everything, so they <laughs> they often gave them free things for the men, but only the men. So, uh, so it, it's a weird backstory. So they're nice, but not very progressive. No, very very conservative, <laughs> um, very very misogynistic, but. You know what? They still were giving away free stuff. It's a very, very tricky situation for me to wrap my head around. Yeah, it sounds like it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, again, this week, Mr. Graham Mason cannot be here because we record these things back to back. So if he wasn't here last week, he's not going to be here this week. Uh, but that's okay. We don't hate him or anything. Uh, <laughs> especially when he listened to this episode. Remember, we don't hate you. Except At least not much. Yeah. Uh, you know. It's like sugar and Tic Tacs. It's not on the labels, but there is sugar in Tic Tacs. It's just less than, you know, what the FDA demands you put. So it's a hatred that's less than, you know. Uh, a sergeant hatred? Uh, it's a no. sergeant hatred, yes. <laughs> uh, no, that's later. Uh, so this week we are talking about, again, if you don't remember from last week or if you missed last week, uh, we are going off the DVD order, not uh, not the Hulu order or Wikipedia order. Um, or air date order, if you want to be super specific. Uh, we are going off what the internet has deemed the correct order, and we are talking about Eeny, Meeny, Miny, Magic. Yes. Uh, and an introduction to, ah, I used to be, for a long time, my favorite Venture Brothers character, which is Dr. Orpheus. Yep. He's uh, pretty incredible, to be honest. He is so good. And now, sadly, you know, after a while, he, he does disappear, and he's not quite as important. But for the first three, four seasons, he's so good. So good. Uh, but before we go too far into it, I did last week. Uh, do you want to break down this episode, Nick, and tell people what it's all about? Yeah, absolutely. So the episode starts off with uh, a few different things happening at night. Uh, Brock is having a nightmare about something that you'll find out later. <laughs> and the boys are playing with a Ouija board where Dean, I believe, asks, will I ever find true love? And then the Ouija board says yes, and then they freak out. Oh, boy. Ooh. Uh, Dr. Orpheus walks out of the, what is the joy can, and basically wreaks havoc a little bit on the <laughs> the Venture household. And, and then the rest of the there. episode really revolves around what the joy can is and why Dr. Orpheus is so obsessed with it, which is that there's some sort of disturbance in the magical force that is around the joy can, which you find out later to be an orphan heart. And <laughs> then basically the joy can brings people in powered by this orphan heart to kind of, I guess, feed off of them in some sort of way, but they never really establish that. Um, but they end up saving Brock and the boys who are trapped inside. You also get an introduction to Dr. Or Dr. Orpheus's daughter, Triana, and kind of Dr. Orpheus's like whole backstory, like that he's divorced, that his wife married a younger necromancer, um, blah, blah, blah. And so it's a very kind of like uh, important episode as well, just like the last one was to the future of the Venture Brothers. But it, it it's kind of a Monster of the Week episode is the way I would probably describe it. I mean, it's a, a little Monster of the Week. It's a little, I mean, this entire episode serves to introduce Orpheus. Mm -hmm. That is mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. who he is, how he acts, his relationship with Dr. Venture. Like, everything is in service of that. Like, clearly they knew this guy was a major character uh, very early on. For sure. They had a really good understanding of who he was and what he, like, wanted to do. I also think that the actor probably helped a lot with that, because there's a lot of stuff that was probably on paper, but the actor really... But clearly the, the direction was, like, really ham it up, and he was like, you mean extremely ham it up? And they were <laughs> like, yes, this is absolutely perfect. Yeah, as weird as you can make it. And, and yes. And absolutely does. Uh. And there's something about, as we've been talking through these early episodes in season one, uh, we have a lot of times where we meet Brock, and he's not quite Brock, but he's pretty close to Brock. Or we met Dr. Venture, and especially in the pilot, it's like, 
well, he's just not Dr. Venture at all. And then, like, in the first episode, he's closer and closer. And throughout a series of the first four or five episodes, they kind of slowly but surely, I mean, I guess slowly it's only five episodes, but still, over a little bit of time, they start figuring out who people are and what they are. Whereas Orpheus is Orpheus right away. Absolutely. Like, like right he, out of the gate. I think some of his verbiage changes a little bit throughout the show. Like, uh, his master, I don't think they name quite the same in this. And there's some things that are just a little different. But as far as, like, character and motivations, mannerisms, all that stuff, spot on from the very beginning. Absolutely. Um, which, which is really kind of impressive. Like, yeah. That's one of the strengths, I think, of the show is that, generally speaking, when they introduce something new, they have clearly thought about it for a while or have incredible instincts. Either way. It's probably a little bit of both. Yeah, I mean, probably. like I love these guys. Like they, they clearly knew the world they were building here, and I just I love the idea that like in this world, they're like yeah, I want Doctor Venture to have to rent out parts of his compound because he's so shitty of a scientist, he can't keep it running. So he'll rent it out as apartment buildings slash labs. Uh, yes. <laughs> oh and, my god. And of course, the first person to rent it is going to be a necromancer and this crazy magician with uh a daughter that for some reason his son is super obsessed with although she gives him nothing ever nothing never Uh, but it's it's very indicative of like i feel like a first crush it's like for sure you're you're invested with no sign of like repercussion or not repercussion um there's no oh shit brian help me out here what's the word i'm looking for reciprocation there you go i was gonna go pineapple yeah, <laughs> it would have been close. P R, you're one letter away. Mm-hmm. Oh God, P Q R. Jesus <laughs> Christ. Oh. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, like you go back to like your own childhood. Like the first girl I ever asked out, her first name was Katie. She was the prettiest girl in fifth grade, and I had to ask her out. I forgot, or not really forgot, did not realize I was the schlubby loser kid who she would never go out with. But she had said hi to me once, so I assumed she loved me. Of course. It's the way it always works. Yeah. Yeah. I I asked her out over a game of tetherball, which she said no after laughing a lot. Ooh, boy. (laughs) That's a very Dean moment of you. (laughs) Thank you. No problem. (laughs) Yeah, I've always felt pretty good about that one. Um... Moving into the show, though, like, I love, almost more than anything in this show, I love the relationship of Dr. Orpheus and Triana. And I like how it's so early established that she she clearly loves her dad. She's not, like, a rebellious teenager. She's just a teenager. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, but she's so over the whole necromancer thing. Yes. Like, from the beginning. Like, not until, like, I want to say season four or five. I think five, when she... No, before, when she goes off to actually start training to be a necromancer. Like, she... She just doesn't care. It's like, I, I just I just want a dad. I just want a dad. I just want to go to school and just not yep. worry about any of this shit. And it's... She does such a good job with that, like... That performance is everything of it. For sure. They do an incredible job. And I, I also think that they do... It, it's very similar, though, to I feel like how you feel as a teenager with whatever your parents' job is. Like, if your parent was, like, the president you know, president of the United States, Baron? you would just be like, who gives a shit? Because yeah. you get to see your parents all the time. So you're like, this isn't special. Yeah, definitely. Like, like it, it's, it's always just kind of like a... I mean, granted, she's supposed to be what? Like 14, 15, you'd guess, somewhere in there? Yeah, uh, for sure, somewhere in there. At that age, it's not quite as important, but it, as a kid, it's just like your your parents' job is the thing that takes them away from you, and it's annoying as hell. Yes, exactly. So the fact that Dr. Orvis's job takes her away from here, and he's just a necromancer, is like, what? No, I don't care about any of this. Exactly. It's just like, blasé. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Moving on to other things of this episode. This also, if you're, again, watching the order that we are, this sets up the relationship with uh, Maltov Cocktees. Yes. Uh, which is amazing. It's a yeah. terrible way to meet her. Like, it terrible. Is a, I was going to say, it is so bad. It like, is such a, like, for a, it's a rare misstep in this show for a character introduction. We talked about Orpheus yeah. being this amazing character introduction. And then what an absolutely horrific character introduction for Molotov. Oh, yeah. When she comes in when she's the boy's babysitter, 
amazing way to meet her. And this one, absolutely, eh, not not that great. Like, it which, does a good job. Like, it sets up that she is the one woman that Brock has ever loved. I like that part of it. Yes. Um, and I like that it, it definitely brings up the fact that although he loves her, they have never slept together. Yes. Um, so I like that those things are in there. It's just such a weird way to meet her. It is, and it's a very it, which it makes me think. Going back to what we talked about for last week's episode, it makes me think that there. Are, I can't really figure out what the order is of this first season because yeah, I have it's no like, idea. I have no idea either, and I think that maybe there isn't one. You know, maybe that there are these weird stringed references to other things that just weren't meant to be done in an actual order. But this this feels very odd it, it feels like a an odd introduction that doesn't feel on purpose it feels like we watched an episode she should be somebody that you go oh when she comes up instead of like who is this yeah definitely like when you see her in the in the joy can you should be like oh he actually gets to bang her now good for him and instead it's like who is this exactly and this is uh you know something that's like also feels to me like it would be so confusing to watch this episode for the first time with knowing without knowing who she is you'd just be like i don't understand what the dilemma is here for brock at all it's like so he gets to sleep with this russian spy with a heart eye patch who cares (laughs) yeah i mean later she becomes super important but it's like eh, at this point it's just it's a weird way to say hi i think i honestly if this is the intended like viewing order i'm more okay with just like i could have been fine with him just apologizing to the guy he killed like that would have been exactly like that would have been enough for me but then you wouldn't have the amazing visual of when the boys go into the joy can yes and and him fighting slash having sex with her was just phenomenal oh it's so good Um, it's such a weird it's such a weird moment but like this show loves doing things like that where it's like you get to see not what somebody's experiencing you're getting to watch somebody else watch them experience it they do that a lot and it's usually to good effect and that's where like uh, just because i'm a super nerd the mechanics of the joy can make no sense to me zero i'm so confused by it (laughs) The, the whole thing i honestly it's one of the things i wanted to bring up which is to me, it is a very odd thing. I often, and this is, you might disagree with this, and it's something I really wanted to ask you about. I think it's too dark for Dr. Venture. Why I would think you say Dr. That? Venture, because I feel like Dr. Venture doesn't have any scruples, but he's not evil. And this, to me, goes closer to evil. Well, that's if you assume he actually used an orphan, which is definitely invaded my vocabulary and i say it all the time if people ask me what the ingredients are i always say orphan because of this episode there you go he didn't use all of it so i guess that's the (laughs) well no that's the one caveat i have always assumed since uh whatever season you find out that all the boys are clones that he didn't use an orphan he used a clone yeah yeah maybe that's always been my assumption because maybe i just like instinctually agree with you that that's too dark for him but taking a slug that he hasn't really made into one of the boys yet and he could just take the heart and use it to power it yeah work. i mean that would explain why it's obsessed with like why it keeps trying to bring the 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 boys and brock in yeah that would explain it and that would explain also why orpheus is drawn to it because it's also the the kind of big uh point of the very very beginning of season two yeah so it, that does make sense that makes a lot of sense actually that's kind of okay, what I, sin- that's what i've always assumed i have nothing to back that up i've never looked into it i've just always kind of assumed that i'm right i you know what i'm gonna throw this out there it makes me feel a lot better about this episode so i'm gonna <laughs> say that you're right <laughs> well good because I, I think that's probably one of those like i just made it up in my head and went yeah i feel a lot better about it like this for sure uh, yeah okay <laughs> all right uh so moving uh forward with this one uh, the, the as much as the joy can's amazing in this episode and i really enjoy a lot of all of that the the highlight of this episode for me is the relationship between venture and uh orpheus and especially yes. as it deteriorates throughout the episode when it starts it's very cordial very polite like oh you're my new tenant i'm your new landlord 
Uh, this room wasn't zoned for a fireplace, but I guess whatever. Uh, and then as the episode goes, they just get so fed up with each other, and it pretty much stays there throughout the rest of their friendship. Absolutely, like, and it's the best. <laughs> like, they make it 20 minutes into a cordial relationship before it's just like, we hate each other. Yep. But they don't, they can... but they do. <laughs> There's a line that Anthony Jeselnik has in one of his specials where he's just like, people I can barely fucking tolerate. And I feel like that's their attitude in a nutshell towards both of each other. They can barely fucking tolerate each other. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, you can definitely tell later on that Orpheus really cares for the boys. He really likes the boys. And yes. I, and he definitely enjoys Brock Sampson to a point. I think he actually really, I think both of them get along really well. You think so? Oh, for sure. There's I mean, the, I guess, um, yeah, yeah. when when he eventually gets kicked out of the, the compound, Brock does just go to hang out. So, yeah, I would say you're probably right. They do just kind of get along. Yeah. So it's really and just, it, they just don't oh, like go ahead, sorry. No, for sure. But to be fair, who likes who likes Rusty? I'm going to continue calling him Rusty because I feel like it's funnier to call him <laughs> that. But really, like, who honestly likes Rusty? I think people tolerate Rusty. I think people will kind of feel bad bad for him and pity him but i don't think that people like him i think there's out of the people who like him i would give him uh billy yeah uh billy yeah um, the the people on that greek island oh yeah they love rusty they yep. love rusty spanakopita uh yep. let's see we got well so yeah, you got like thirty people there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was gonna say Brock, but I don't think Brock really likes him. I think Brock's just kind of okay with him. I, I think there are times where Brock and him connect, but I think that I think for for Brock, Rusty is much more of a frustration than an actual friend. Which yeah. is there are times where they can be friendly, but I yeah no. Like, there's definite times where they get along. Like, they have moments yes. where they laugh and they reminisce and that sort of stuff. Like, there are moments where you can tell they've been through shit together and they enjoy each other's company. But yes. if it wasn't for the boys, I don't think Brock would stick around. Boys and job. But once the job's yes. done, he would not have been staying on the outskirts of the compound protecting the boys with Sphinx if it was... Like, he wouldn't have done that for Venture. No, or for not at all. Yeah. Zero percent. Um, um, what else in this I, episode that we haven't talked about? One thing I actually, it's like more of a high concept thing, but I think that it's brought up with Dr. Orpheus because with Dr. Orpheus, it's much funnier to have him be like an over the top, like really absurd sort of character and then have him obsessed with like this like small stuff. So the, him leaving the message on the bizarre like recording device, that's a skull. Oh, yeah. Um, but also like the door gag I'm obsessed with because it's this like bringing in of oh, it's a, it's a necromancer who can do tons of stuff. He puts the boys to sleep. He destroys Helper. He destroys the joy can at the end of the episode. But they both leave his little apartment, and then it's just this sh static shot of the door. And then he opens it back up, and he's like, see, I told you, it wasn't locked. And then that's it. <laughs> it's such a bizarre thing, but it's such a Venture brothers E thing of taking this like high-concept show and putting in this like normal life stuff in to kind of help balance the whole thing out. Well, yeah, it's a, like that's just a, it's a subtle version of it, but it's just the world building. Like they're so yes. good at the world building of like no matter how crazy and ludicrous this shit is, it's still the real world. Exactly, and um, it it works really well to have that balance. Yeah. Um, another thing that comes up in this episode that I think is uh, really important to the clones that come up later uh, is their dog uh, Scamp. Yeah. Like. Clearly, they've died so many times, and they haven't aged for so long that if yep. they'd had a dog, of course a dog would have died. Like, <laughs> of course. Like, I love that they don't really like. It's clearly why they aren't able to go to real school. They can't do anything normal. Like, because they're growing at like a third the rate that the rest of the world is growing up. Exactly, and it's just perplexing like it, i mean in a really kind of great way but you don't ever really connect with that at all until obviously they reveal it and then you're like oh like a lot of this stuff starts to click yeah and they die at the end of the first season right yes yeah. yes they do and dr orpheus feels like it's his fault i kind of was yeah kind of <laughs> uh i also love the this is this to me is also the start of the show not really knowing what to do with dean 
they really figure out that Hank is obsessed with Brock, which makes sense, and that the two of them have uh, kind of like a a more older brother or maybe like older cousin relationship sort of thing. And it works like with the whole Hank stacking the quarters, not being able to obviously do anything. And Brock's like, start with one and work your way up. Like it's more of like a, you know, like loving relationship, but Dean doesn't have that at all. Like he doesn't really get along with Dr. Venture, but he's the closest thing that Dr. Venture has to a son. That's like him. What happened to calling him Rusty? You've already backed out on calling him Rusty. Oh, you're right. Shit. <laughs> with Rusty? Um, no, but you know what I mean. Like, with, with Rusty, it's like the two of them don't really get along, and they don't really have a counterpart for, for Dean. They always find a partner for Hank. They always find somebody for Hank to kind of really connect with, and they don't really have that for Dean at all. Oh, it's Dean, very it's interesting. Uh, Dean never has that. Like, even when he moves never. to New York on his own, like he still doesn't have anything. Like Exactly. Uh, it, it's kind of interesting, because you can tell that Venture... Or Rusty, if you want to call him that. Uh, Rusty definitely wants Dean to take after him. Like, he wants to get him in the speed suits. He wants to get him in science. <laughs> he wants to get yes. him in, like, prog rock. Like, he wants to get him in, like, everything that he's into. But he doesn't want to put in the legwork of actually being a dad. Exactly. Like, he just wants him to be like, hey, you're like me now. Why are you not immediately like me? I just said that you're like me. Why are you not taking after everything that I do? Whereas, like, Hank just kind of goes off and lives his life. Exactly. He has no interest in really, like, following in those footsteps. But also, Hank is just more independent. Yeah. I think that's really what it comes down to, is that Dean is very much so, like, too scared to really do much for most of the show. And then they do a good job of fleshing that out and making him grow. Yeah, for sure. Um, Is there anything in this episode specifically we haven't talked about, or should we move into favorite moments? Uh, There... I, let me check my notes We've very talked quickly. a little bit about Triana. Uh, we talked a little bit about Triana. We talked about... Yeah, we really covered a lot. Um, there oh, is oh, one... There is one other thing that I, I need to mention in this. Uh, okay. This is the first mention of something that comes up a lot. We were just kind of br- briefly talking about it. Uh, that Rusty does not love his sons. Yes. Like, does not. Uh, it finally gets a totally answered in the most recent season when they have to try to get through to him by having people hold the things that he loves around him and it doesn't work with the boys um yes but this is the first time it happens when he's trying to get through to the boys in the joy can and he's talking with dr venture and he's like oh usually the true love thing works every time and they just kind of have like a weird pause but then move on it and it's like oh that's because he does not love his sons no they they even to to illustrate that point further i wrote down a quote where uh triana asked dean do you or sorry yeah no triana asked dean if uh his dad is a nickname for him and he's like no i i've heard my dad call me dave or don a few times and you're just like god <laughs> damn it like Ooh. like rusty i i'm gonna for those of you who have not uh pay attention after the hype or who don't know i uh i have a son whose due date is seven days from tomorrow uh, and I have in the back of my head, I will always be a better father than Rusty Venture. Like I, yes, <laughs> like no matter absolutely. how worried I could be about it, I will always be better than Rusty Venture. <laughs> it's very true. <laughs> um, uh, there, there is one other thing I wanted to bring up that is like completely nonsense. But when the when Doctor Orpheus and Rusty are in the kitchen together, Doctor Orpheus w- opens up one of like the cupboards and just pulls out a lone cupcake. <laughs> I found that so strange. That is definitely a second viewing sort of thing, but I was like, who the fuck just puts a random cupcake in a cupboard? Oh, yeah. That's that, it. I love that. <laughs> I, I, just, I love the... Uh, the um, when he's telling... When Orpheus is telling Triana to go off with Dean, like, oh, yeah, you guys can have one of those like prepackaged cereals you seem to enjoy. It's just like... Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, good stuff. Uh, all Good right, stuff. so favorite moments in this thing. Uh, we've already talked about mine, and it's because it has just invaded my vocabulary. Uh, it has to be when he says, what was this made of? And he goes, oh, you know, this, that, 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 that. An orphan. An yeah. orphan? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so good. It's, oh, my God, I love it so much. Uh, I would say mine is this line that Dean had where Hank, I can't remember what Hank says, but Dean goes, I dare you to make less sense. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what a great line for the boys oh the boys have some really good episodes really good moments in this episode yes Uh, yes they do 
Okay, uh, so let's move into a final round of plugs here. Uh, we have, of course, ATHpod.com, where you can find this show, our flagship show, After the Hype, and uh, any other show that we have coming up throughout the rest of this year. Uh, be sure to check back often, and uh, that's it for me. Nick, do you have anything you want to plug, like a video game you're working on? No, I don't have uh, anything. I'm not working on anything. I'm just sitting in this room for 24 hours a day just waiting to record a new podcast. I don't believe you. Uh, No, I don't believe me either. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, so thank you very much for listening. Uh, Hopefully in the next episode we will have Graham back. I know he's very upset that he can't be on either one of these things because he's one of the only people I know who loves Venture Brothers as much as you and I do. Yeah, absolutely. We will get him back. Uh, yeah. Thank you, everybody, for listening, and bye! Before you go, oh, no. before you stop recording, I wanted to bring up this theory, and I wanted to save it for the end so people could skip it if they really wanted to. Oh, but I'm, I'm totally convinced... going to put this after the theme music. Okay, perfect. <laughs> that works for me. Uh, the I am convinced that for this episode and the last episode, they tried a new animation house, and they did not like it. Honestly, I've never paid attention, but I now knowing that, I'd love to go back and rewatch it. I this episode in particular, the proportions of Doctor Orpheus are fucking crazy. They are oh, all over the place, and Triana's face is just weird. Yes, they. It makes no sense. But the last episode, I think they went with a very cartoony sort of style because there's a few faces in there that don't quite match when. Um, when Rusty is the caterpillar and he shakes his hands, it's a very, like, classic animation-y thing that they almost never do in the Venture Brothers. Almost oh, yeah. never. For sure. Um, and then this episode, the the proportions of, like, Dr. Orpheus, of Triana, of the boys, like, everything is just kind of really wacky. And so I'm convinced that they used it. And I know in the commentary of the DVD, they complain about in the first two seasons, some of the animation houses that they go through. And I think they finally settle on a good one around season three. But I think that this is one of the ones that they tried and they were like, what the fuck? (laughs) So, because like, really, if you rewatch this episode, just look at Dr. Orpheus and you're just like, I have no idea what he looks like. Like, I I can't quite figure out the way they want him to look. It's very interesting. So it's, I just wanted to save that for the end. Um, but it's something that's always bothered me about this episode. And then knowing what I know now, I'm like, oh, I bet it's an animation house thing. I bet you're totally right. Yes. <laughs> okay, so bye for real. Bye for real. Bye for real.